you brought your Bible, your tablet, am I on uh, right here? If you brought your Bible, your tablet, uh, iPod, whatever, let's go ahead and raise those up high and make our weekly declaration together, shall we? <clears throat> this is the Word of God. It is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. It's a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I believe everything it says. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. And everyone agreed and said, Amen and Amen. Well, again, if you are a guest with us this morning, we want to welcome you. We uh, recently uh, began a study going through uh, Paul's letter to Titus. And we saw that Paul's primary reason for writing Titus was to make sure that every church in every city, literally city by city. So in every church, in every city, that Titus set in order things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Things pertaining to kingdom leadership, number one, and the kingdom living, number two. And Paul's phrase in Titus 1.5, set in order, it really speaks of two things. First of all, it speaks of correcting things that were wrong, and secondly, completing things that were lacking or that needed attention, things that were not yet finished. And loved ones, this is a vital part of kingdom leadership. Kingdom leaders are called to correct things that are wrong and to complete things that are lacking, that are unfinished. Because the fact of the matter is that every church, because no church is perfect, has things that need to either be corrected or completed. And because no church is a finished product, each area and ministry of the church needs attention in order to bring it into better alignment with the principles and the practices of God's kingdom. And thus far... In chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2, Paul has addressed the issue of kingdom leadership, as was mentioned, and he has also spoken into the importance of kingdom relationships amongst the various generations that make up the various churches that he was overseeing and ministering to, and how as generations, how we should should relate one to another and how generations play a vital part in the health and life of a church. Now, as we look at the last part of chapter 2 of Titus, Paul, he starts addressing kingdom living. And so if you have not yet turned in your Bibles to Titus, would you please do so? Titus is uh, a book that is right before First and Second Thessalonians and First and Second Timothy. It is be before uh, Philemon and, and Hebrews in your New Testament. Titus chapter two, beginning in verse nine. <clears throat> Paul writes this: Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything. To be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Now, remember that in his introduction... 
that Paul, he referred to himself as a bondservant of the Lord. And back in Paul's day, under Roman rule, slavery was a normal part of society back then. And it's important, though, to understand that Paul, he never, ever affirms, nor does he endorse slavery, but he does acknowledge its existence within his culture. And within our culture, though, and within our context here in the United States, slavery is not a common or acceptable practice, and rightly so. But we can look at these two verses, verses 9 and 10, in light of Jesus, who is our master and our king, and we are his bond servants. We are bond servants of the Lord. And the word Lord can be translated master. In Luke chapter 5, verse 5, Peter spoke to Jesus and he said, Master, Master. In Luke chapter 17, verse 13, there were ten lepers, and they saw Jesus, and one of them spoke out and said, Master, have mercy on us. And in John chapter 13, verse 13, Jesus said this. He says, you call me master and teacher, and you do well, for so I am. It's really one of the I am statements. I am your master. And so looking at verses 9 and 10, through the lens that we are bond servants and that Jesus is our master, we discover some very, very <coughs> profound things in regard to how we should relate to Jesus in our relationship with him. He says, urge bond slaves, first of all, to be subject to their own masters. And so how does this apply to us in our relationship with Jesus? Well, we too are to be, as bond servants, subject to our master. You see, this is the posture that we must take. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is master. And notice what the caveat is here. And that is, Paul says, in everything. Not in some things. Not in many things. Not in most things. But in everything be subject to our master. In other words, in all areas and facet of our life. Then he goes on. And he says, teach them to be well-pleasing. And so... In that light, the call upon our lives is that we too should be well-pleasing to our master, Jesus Christ. You see, we don't live to please ourselves. We live for God's pleasure. We live to please Him. You see, that's why... We have been placed here on this earth to bring pleasure to God. Now he also says something else, and that is, teach them to not be argumentative <laughs> towards our master. Oh, how we love to argue with God and give him our counsel, right? Because we know so much and he knows so little. Our counsel. We argue with God about things. This, this word argumentative, it, it simply means do not contradict the Lord. 
Don't contradict him. Now, how do we contradict him? Well, when his word says something and we disagree with it or we disregard it or disdain it or we deliberately resist it, in that act, we are arguing with God. We are contradicting God. We are basically saying, God, I don't care what you say. I'm going to believe what I want to believe, and I'm going to do what I want to do, even though your word tells me differently. You know, sometimes even the way we pray is a way of arguing or contradicting God. Why? Because we, we pray basically that our will be done, not thy will be done. How often have we tried to convince God to do our will? How often do we counsel Him to do our will? You see, we have a tendency even in our prayers to push our agenda rather than the Master's agenda. Let's not be argumentative towards our Master. Only one response, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let's not contradict Him. Then he goes on, and he says, not pilfering from our Master. Interesting. Simply put, do not steal what belongs to the Master. Don't steal His glory. Don't, don't, don't steal anything that belongs to Him. And yet oftentimes we do steal from God. We, we pilfer our time. We pilfer our talents. We, we pilfer our treasures because all of those things belong to Him. You see, we are just called to be stewards of that which is His. And so, don't take or don't keep or don't steal what belongs to God. He goes on. And he says, show good faith towards our master. A good faith. A good faith is not a presumptuous faith. Where we presume upon the Lord. Or we presume upon others. You know that Proverbs tells us that through presumption comes nothing but strife. Have you found that to be true? You presume that God wants this or that God wants that. You presume upon uh, a brother or a sister in Christ that what you heard is, is, is true or accurate. Through presumption comes nothing but strife. And so we are to show good faith. A good faith must be placed in God versus having faith in our faith. We're never called to have faith in our faith. We are called to have faith in God and God alone. A good faith, it speaks of something that is filled with fidelity and faithfulness, therefore giving it full and true faith. Showing good faith is that we believe the best. We believe the best about God because the enemy will lie to us about God. He doesn't care. He's not hearing your prayer. He won't do this. He won't do that. God is not for you. He's against you. And we hear all these different lies from the enemy, but faith, showing good faith, faith believes the best. And then, perhaps my favorite thing that we should do in re regards to our relationship with Jesus, our Master, is he says this. Check it out. He says, adorn yourselves in the doctrine of the Master. Guys, I love this. <laughs> 
hey, here's a novel idea. Let's teach what Jesus taught. Let's adorn ourselves with the words of our master. Let his words become our words. Let his doctrine become our doctrine. Oh, loved ones, if we would only do what Jesus teaches us to do in relationships, in families, in the workplace, in the marketplace, in our ministries, in the meeting place, just think of it. Just think of it. Could you imagine what every church would be like if we just all adorned ourselves with the doctrine of the Master and lived accordingly? Watch out. Watch out. So let's be committed as we represent Him to the world. And as we represent Him to one another, let's adorn ourselves with the doctrine of Christ. Let's speak His words. Let's teach what He taught. Let His doctrine be our doctrine. Now, Paul goes on. Then he kind of shifts gears in verse 11. And he says this, <clears throat> For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Notice that word sensibly again. That was the word that he used when he addressed the various generations. The older men, be sensible. The older women, teach the younger women to be sensible. The younger women, be sensible. Younger men, be sensible. It's a very popular word that Paul uses here in the book of Titus. Verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. So, Paul in verse 11 he tells us, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now, a good question would be, well, what is the grace of God? A better question would be, who is the grace of God? And the answer to that question is Jesus. Jesus appeared and brought salvation. You see, loved ones, Jesus is the manifestation of grace to the world. And what did this grace do besides bringing salvation? Notice in verse 12. What did grace do? Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. That's what grace teaches. Loved ones, hear this. Any message on grace that does not motivate or move you to deny sin is not a true message of grace. Grace, true grace, as we see here in Titus, should instruct us to and lead us into a life of obedience to God. We read about this. <clears throat> if you'd like to turn there, you can. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes this to the church of Rome. He says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin? Here it is, so that grace may increase or abound. 
May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And so Paul is teaching Titus and all the readers of this epistle that kingdom living requires, listen, a kind of grace that not only forgives us of our sin, but also frees us from our sin. You see, that's true grace. True grace not only forgives, true grace also frees. And so we should never be content with just forgiveness. God wants us, listen, He wants us to experience freedom as well. And that's what grace does. Grace empowers us to be free from the power of sin in our lives. And so, you see, the problem with us struggling with sin is never ever the grace of God. It is whether or not we are listening to its instruction and applying it to our lives. You see, grace is so amazing. Because it not only forgives us of our sin, but it is also meant to free us of our sin. And that, my friends, is the true message of grace. And that is why it is so amazing. <clears throat> now in verses 13 and 14. Paul says this. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. Now, it's here that we also discover that God's grace instructs us to look for the blessed hope and the appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace will always instruct you to look to Jesus. Did you hear that? Grace will always instruct you to look to Jesus. And not only look to Jesus, but look to Jesus and the appearing of His glory in your life, in the future glory that is to come upon His appearance and His return to earth. Now, notice... The blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of, here it is, our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Now, this is one of many verses in the New Testament that affirms the deity of Christ. You see, Christ Jesus is our great God and Savior. And this is a vital truth if we want to walk in sound doctrine, which, which Paul has been hitting on. He's talked about a sound faith, sound doctrine, sound speech, a sound mind. You see, denying the deity of Christ is strange doctrine. It is not sound doctrine. And what are we to be doing? We're to be looking for this appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. This phrase, looking for, it speaks of an expectancy that is marked by hope. You see, Christians should be the most hopeful and hope-filled people on the face of the earth. Oh God, teach us to not only be thankful, but teach us to be hopeful. And one of the things that we are to be hopeful for and expectant of is looking for the appearing of the glory of Jesus in our lives presently and in his future return. You see, guys, any doctrine or teaching 
that instructs you to not look for the coming of Jesus is not sound doctrine. Jesus' return is vital to the gospel narrative. It is part of the gospel, you see. I remember reading from a local pastor here in the area that was, was really condemning people for wanting Jesus to return. Saying, do you realize that, that your prayers for Jesus' return means that millions of people are going to go to hell? Should have been trained in theology a bit more, you see. Because the doctrine of Christ teaches us to look for, to expectantly hope for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. And notice, it's a blessed hope, loved ones. The word blessed means happy. And so the hope of Jesus' return should make us happy. Now, notice what Paul does as he's writing to Titus, and it's this. Verse 11 speaks of Jesus' first appearance. For the grace of God has appeared, past tense, bringing salvation to all men. That is speaking of Jesus' first appearance. Verse 13 speaks of another appearance, one that we are to look for. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing, a second appearance of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. And so this second appearance is referred to as something that is going to be glorious. Huh, hallelujah. Maranatha, Lord cometh. Oh, how glorious a day that is going to be when our Master comes and takes us to be with Him. It is the hope of glory that Scripture writes about. You see, Jesus' first appearance was marked by grace. His second appearance will be marked by glory. Hallelujah. Grace and glory are always interconnected. Where there is grace, glory is soon to follow. Where grace appears, glory also appears. You might say that grace is the gateway for glory and to glory, and that grace always awaits glory's kiss, glory's companionship, glory's arrival. And where grace abounds, glory abounds even more. And so, loved ones, may these two virtues be prevalent in the life and the ministry of the church. You see, kingdom living, which we're talking about this morning, kingdom living should be marked by at least two things. It should be marked by glory, and it should be marked by grace. It should be marked by grace, and it should be marked by glory. Oh, for the church to see, and oh, for, for the world to see more grace in the life of the church. But a true grace, a true grace that instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Oh, but it is a grace that forgives us of all our sins, washes us clean, but it's also a grace that not only forgives us, it frees us, oh, that we would see this grace abounding in the life 
of God's church throughout the earth and His glory. His glory. May our prayer be, God, show us Your glory in an era of, of performance and, and entertainment and showmanship in the church. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to Thy name be the glory. There's too many glory seekers in the kingdom of God. The only glory we should be seeking after is God's glory in our midst. And loved ones, those two things, the grace of God and the glory of God, will set the church aflame and on fire, and the world will come and watch us burn and be fired up for Jesus. Grace and glory glory and grace. And notice what verse 14 says. <laughs> Who gave himself. You see, Jesus is a gift to the world. He is a gift to all those who will but believe. Jesus was not forced he volunteered. He gave himself for us. Who gave himself? Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when he gave himself, what did he do? Why did he give himself? Notice, to redeem us. One of my favorite themes of the Bible is redemption. I love it. And Jesus is a redeemer. And that's why we should live life through redemptive eyes. We should speak redemptive words. We should pray redemptive prayers. We should act redemptively because that is close and near to the heart of Jesus. It's why He came. He is our Redeemer. And as I said, He not only rescues us from our sin, He redeems us from our sin. And the word redeemed is one of the most beautiful words in the entire Bible. It means this. It means to bring forward a ransom. Now, how cool is that? To redeem means to bring forward a ransom. It means to release by payment. Meaning this, that on the cross, Jesus paid for our sins. He gave himself as a ransom. <laughs> you see, as the saying goes, Jesus paid a price that he did not owe because we owed a price that we could not pay. And it was a precious price that he paid upon the cross. And according to verse 11, this salvation is available to all men because Jesus died for all men. You see... Jesus loves you so much that he thinks that you are to die for. And so, here's the deal. Jesus wants what he paid for. Could you say that out loud with me? Jesus wants what he paid for. That means you. And that means me. Not just a ransomed and redeemed church, but get this, a radiant church. One according to Titus that is pure. And that reflects His grace and that reflects His glory throughout the earth. Would you stand with me? And we're going to close 
In a word of prayer, I'm going to ask the prayer team, the elders, to come forward. And let's pray this prayer out loud together, shall we? Let's begin. Jesus, our great God and Savior, we declare that you alone are our master, and we bow our hearts today at the foot of the cross. Help us to live lives that are well-pleasing to you. May we never argue with you or take what is yours. Help us to walk in good faith, and may we always adorn ourselves with the doctrine of Christ, reflecting and revealing the grace and glory of our Lord. In your name we pray, amen and amen. So we close in this song of worship. If you have need of prayer in regard to anything, we want to partner with you. We want to pray with you and, and for you and, and over you in the name of the Lord. We want to take your needs to the foot of the cross. We want to take your needs to the Master, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The one who says that nothing is too impossible for him. Maybe you have health situations. He cares about that. Maybe you're in between jobs. He cares about that. Maybe you're having relationship issues. He cares about that. Maybe you're having problems adorning yourself with the doctrine of Christ. He cares about that. The scripture tells us he's a present help in time of need. Would you come and be prayed for and let him be your present help in your time of need? And should you be here and you have never given your life to Jesus, I want to exhort you and encourage you. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And that no man can come to the Father but through Him. You see, Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus is the truth about heaven. Jesus allows us to experience the life of heaven, which is an abundant and eternal life. That's why He came. That's why He gave Himself up for us. Not only to forgive and to free, but also to give you a future and a hope where you would be with Him for all eternity. If you have not yet made that step, I want to encourage you to come and, and let somebody know. Let, let them know that uh, I've placed my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ. Turn to the person next to you and let them know. It's all about Jesus. I encourage you to run after Him with all that is within you. God bless you, God.